Welcome to Meeple Mentor. I'm Jared, and we're about to play Tekenu, Obelisk of the Sun. Let's take a look. I'll show you how. Feel free to pause the video as needed to follow along with your copy of the game. My goal is this video can not only teach you to play, but can be shown at the game table to help set up and teach the game at your next game session. As part of that goal, I've added chapter timestamps in the description to the different sections of the tutorial to easily recap relevant rules for you. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell below the video so you don't miss any of my latest content. Tekenu takes place four millennia ago on the eastern bank of the Nile River. It's here where the Temple of Amun-Ra was built in a site known as Karnak in modern-day Egypt, helped create and grow one of the most impressive religious sites in the world, honoring the Egyptian gods Horus, Ra, Hathor, Bastet, Thoth, and Osiris. Players in the game will draft dice from around the large obelisk in the center of the board, taking actions in one of the six sections associated with each of the Egyptian gods. While the sun's shadow shifts around the obelisk throughout the game, some of the dice are in the sunny areas, some in the shade, and some in the dark. This affects the player's actions possible each round. Plan and make the best decisions each turn to score the most points. Whoever scores the most points at the end of the game wins. Let's look first at how to set it up. First, put the main game board in the middle of the table with the obelisk wheel in its spot. Place the Tekenu obelisk through the hole and align the wheel to a random position, making sure the sections line up with the action areas. Find the arrow on the wheel and the two scoring markers. Put the single hourglass token four sections from the arrow going clockwise. Then put the double hourglass token another four sections clockwise from the first one. Take all these square pillar tiles and shuffle them into a face down stack next to the game board at the top. Draw three and place them face up in the display. Next, you can shuffle the Horus bonus tiles and put them in a random order on the six spaces in the Horus action area. However, for your first game, you can simply use the pre-printed bonuses instead. Create supply piles to the side of the board for all the resources, scribes, and faith tokens. Gather five of the gold resource. Put two on the statue spaces by the temple complex. Place two in the statue spaces above the workshops and quarries area, then the last one to the side of the second row there. Collect all the dice and create the dice pool for your game dependent on player count. All the dice will go in the bag in a four player game. In a three player game, return two gray dice to the box first. In a two player game, return one yellow, brown, white, and black dice to the box and put the rest in the bag. Next, draw three dice at a time for each of the sections around the obelisk wheel and roll them. Once rolled, place the colored dice in the correct row based on if the die is pure, tainted, or forbidden. The gray dice are always considered tainted. The other four colors alternate between pure, tainted, and forbidden depending on the amount of light in that section. Basically, the dice are pure where it matches the brightness of the area. Now each player should take a player board and all the colored pieces of their chosen color. Put your six statues at the bottom of the player board in the statue spaces for them. Put one production marker on the number two position of each of the four production tracks in the center of your player board. Set the eight pillar tokens aside by the player boards. They don't have a spot to go on. Also leave your Mott marker next to your board for now. Put all ten buildings at the top of your player board in the spaces for them. Everyone should put their victory point marker on space ten of the point track. Put the small Meeple Happiness markers on space 2 of the Populous track. Place the larger Meeple Population marker on space 5 there. You'll note there are starting space icons above those spots. Give everyone one gold and one scribe to start with. Find all the Blessing, Technology, and Decree cards. In a solo or two-player game, remove Technology 16 and Decree 20 from their decks and put them back in the box. Otherwise, shuffle each deck separately and put them to the side of the board. You'll now create the face-up card market. In the first section, put out two blessing cards and one technology. In the second section, put out two blessings and two technologies. The green and blue sections won't have cards out yet. Leave them empty. Shuffle all the starting cards and draw out a number of them face-up on the table dependent on player count. Draw five for a two-player game, seven for a three-player game, and nine for a four-player game. 
then place the four Destiny cards out with them also face up. These cards will be drafted to determine everyone's starting resources and first round turn order. First, randomly choose a starting player to begin the draft process. Go clockwise with each player drawing one of the starting cards to their hand. This will be a snake draft, meaning after everyone's drawn their first card, start with the last player drawing a second card and go counterclockwise back to the start player. Add up the initiative values on the two starting cards you've chosen. Place everyone's MOT markers on the turn order track in descending order based on the highest initiative values. In a tie, the player with the highest printed value on a card places their MOT marker first. In this new turn order, everyone takes turns choosing one of the four Destiny cards. The Ankh value on these cards doesn't matter now, but can affect ties in turn order later in the game. From the two starting cards and destiny card chosen, each player gains the resources shown. The used starting cards can return to the game box after taking the shown resources. Any extra starting cards can also return to the game box. Make sure to keep your destiny card near you for the remainder of the game. You're now set up and ready to play. The gameplay of Tekenu revolves quite literally around the obelisk in the center of the game board. Thematically and mechanically, it represents the sun's light casting shadows around the areas of Karnak into each of the six sections. Each section represents a different Egyptian god and has its own actions possible. Looking at the base of the obelisk, you'll see six sections of light. Two of them are in direct sun, two in darkness, and two in the shade. Every two rounds, the obelisk rotates one section clockwise, changing which sections have light, darkness, and shade. Understanding how the various light affects the rolled dice is a key concept to the gameplay. Each time new dice are drawn from the bag to be placed into the sections, they are immediately categorized according to their color and the corresponding light in that section. This is the main reason the dice are colored, to categorize if it comes out as pure, tainted, or forbidden. They also correspond to the various resources that can be collected. There's five possible colors of dice that can come out white, black, yellow, brown, and gray. Depending on the position of the shadows in a section, each die is considered either pure, tainted, or forbidden. The dice are placed in one of the three rows for those classifications. In the sunny areas, white dice are pure, yellow and gray dice are tainted. The black and brown dice are forbidden there. Note that gray dice are always placed in the tainted rows in any kind of brightness. In shaded areas, yellow and brown dice are pure, White, black, and gray dice are tainted. There are no forbidden dice in a shaded area. In the darkest areas, only the black dice are pure. The brown and gray dice are tainted. The white and yellow dice are forbidden. Think of it as wherever the color of the dice matches the current brightness, it's considered pure there. Each round, players take turns choosing a die to take an action. Forbidden dice can never be chosen. The dice are placed on their player board on the scales. Pure dice go on the left, and tainted dice go on the right. Every two rounds of taking dice, the obelisk rotates, and new dice are drawn, rolled, and added to the two shaded sections. Every two rotations, meaning all players have placed four dice on their player boards, you'll rotate the obelisk and immediately proceed to a mot phase. During the mot phase, the deeds of the people are evaluated against the feather of justice, and players are rewarded or punished accordingly. These phases will determine player order for the next few rounds. First, players calculate the balance of their scales. Every pip on dice on the left of the scales count as positive, and the values on the right side counts as negative. Any excess resources players collected from production that they couldn't keep will pile onto the tainted side of the scales. Each one of these also counts as a negative to the balance. Players want to have as close to net zero as possible. To offset any imbalance, players may place any number of faith tokens they've collected onto either side of the scales. Each faith token will be one point of negative or positive value to the side it's placed on. Now you'll move all players' MOT markers from the turn order track and place them on the MOT track according to the final balance of their scales. Net zero balanced players put their disc on the zero spot here in the middle. Negative balance valued players put their discs on the track below, while net positive players put their discs on the top track. Any player with three or more negative balance will lose points on the victory point track as punishment. You'll lose points based on these ranges. Players can never go below zero victory points. After everyone's discs are on the track and players have appropriately lost their victory points, put all the markers back onto the turn order track. 
They're placed in ascending order based on their balance. Players in perfect balance at net zero are first, then plus minus one, plus or minus two, etc. When there's a tie, players with the higher Ankh value on their destiny card go on the track first. A positive and negative value of the same number are tied regardless of being positive or negative. So a positive two is tied with a negative two. Their Ankh values will determine their turn order. To continue the Mott phase, check to see if the arrow on the obelisk wheel is pointing at the lowest numbered still in play scoring marker, i.e. the hourglasses. If so, you'll do a scoring phase, which I'll explain further later. Then return all dice from the player's boards to the draw bag. All excess resources and faith tokens on the scales are returned to the supply. Additionally, all unused faith tokens are returned. They can't be kept past a Mott phase. All destiny cards now go to the middle of the table, and in the new turn order, everyone gets to choose one of them again and take the reward shown on the card. These new Ankh values will apply in the next Mott phase as well. Let's look now at how the game proceeds in general with all the different rounds and phases that occur. Then I'll get into the specifics of the actions you can take on turns which use the dice. The game takes place over multiple rounds, one at a time, with intermittent phases. In a single round, players take one turn each according to the turn order track. On your turn, take one die from any section around the wheel to take an action, usually related to the god section it's pointing to. Only pure or tainted dice can be chosen. Forbidden dice are, well, forbidden. Take your chosen die without changing its value and put it on the scales on your player board. Remember that pure dice sit on the left and tainted dice go on the right. Then choose to use the die for the god action or for producing resources based on the color of the dice. Gray dice can't be used to gain resources. The value of the die determines how the god action is performed or how many resources you can collect. I'll cover the god's actions in detail later. You're able to spend one or more scribes to alter the value of a die you take. Each scribe lets you tick the die up or down one or two steps. It can never go below one or above six, nor can this be used to wrap around. If opting to produce resources instead of doing a god action, it doesn't matter which area of the die it was taken from. Instead, the color and value are what matter. The value is how many of that resource you can produce. Yellow dice produce papyrus, brown dice produce bread, white dice produce limestone, and black dice produce granite. Gray dice aren't associated with a resource and don't produce anything. Take the number of resources equal to the value of the die and compare it to your production capacity on your player board for that resource type. Keep the number shown on your production track, adding it to your collected supply in front of you. The excess produced in this action must be placed on the tainted scale side of your player board. These count as negative during the Mott phase and can never be used. Taking more than you can produce taints your soul with greed. To increase how many you can keep when doing a production action, you'll need to increase your production markers during the game. It's important to note, you can have any number of resources collected to spend. The production markers only tell you how many you keep from any one production action. There's a special turn you can take if you spend two scribes, the Anubis action. You may take any die from anywhere around the obelisk, even dice that are forbidden, and use it to do any action. It could be any god action or any resource to collect. Only the value of the die is relevant. You can even use extra scribes to alter the die's value. After doing your action this way, put the die below the scales on your player board. It won't count towards your Mott phase balance. After performing your god action or production action, turns proceed to the next player according to turn order. After the last player is gone, proceed back to the first player in turn order. However, if it's the last player's turn and they have two or four dice on their board, that signals it's time to do an obelisk rotation. So, every two rounds, the obelisk rotates clockwise one section, which changes the areas that are bright, shaded, and dark. After rotating, check if it's time for a Mott phase. These happen every two rotations, meaning everyone has four dice on their boards. If so, do the Mott phase like I explained earlier, and come back to these obelisk rotation steps. Regardless of a Mott phase, you'll next add new dice to the two shaded sections. Draw a number of dice equal to the number of players to add to each section. Roll them and place them according to their pure and tainted colors. Since the brightness has changed every section, you must now go through each of the sections and make sure they are all adjusted accordingly. 
Each dice needs to be corrected now based on its color and the brightness of the area it's now sitting in. Refer back to my earlier explanation of the obelisk light levels, then proceed with a new round. Every two Mott phases has a scoring phase step after players gain new destiny cards. It'll be every eight rounds, i.e. every four rotations of the obelisk. The arrow on the wheel will be pointing at the silver hourglass token for the first scoring phase. It will be pointing at the double hourglass token for final scoring of the game. The game board and player boards have areas that score, as indicated by the hourglass icons. After the second scoring phase, the game ends and everyone's individual decree cards are scored. I'll go into the various god actions next, then describe fully how scoring works later. The god actions can be taken if using a pure or tainted die from its associated section, or a player can pay two scribes to take and use any die to take a god action. Remember that the die taken from the pure or tainted rows go to your player board balance scales. One used from the Anubis action don't go on the scales and instead sit below and don't count at all towards it. Scribe tokens can be spent to increase or decrease a die value by one or two. Some actions require you to spend resources to take the action. Gold is a wild resource and can substitute for papyrus, bread, limestone, or granite. Scribes and faith tokens are special use tokens that aren't considered resources. If you want to take an action that requires you to spend resources you don't have, you can't take the action. You may need to choose a different die altogether. During the game, you'll be placing out your buildings, pillars, and statues in various places. Once placed, they are never moved. Once you've built all you have of a given type, you've maxed out. The Horus God action lets you build one statue on the board. Your statues are built from left to right from your player board. The granite cost will be shown below the statue you're building. Statues can be built in honor of a god around the obelisk wheel or in one of the four spaces for the people. There's two available spots for statues for the people around the temple and two spots above the workshops and quarries. As long as it's empty, you can build a statue there and collect the gold resource sitting there. For these four spots, the value of the dice used doesn't matter. When placing a statue around the temple, you get to immediately score three victory points for each of your pillars in the same row or column as the statue. To build a statue in honor of a god, the value of the die used determines which god section of the obelisk your statue is placed. After paying the granite for the statue, put it in an empty spot for statues by the wheel in the associated section. From then on, whenever another player takes that god action, you gain the bonus shown next to the corresponding god. In a three-player game, you also receive the bonus right after building it. In a two-player game, you get to receive the bonus when you perform the god action yourself, as well as your opponent. The three spaces for statues in each section aren't all available in different player counts. Only one is available in each section in a two-player game, and two are available in a three-player game. The next god action clockwise is Raw. The Raw God action lets you raise one pillar in the temple to the right. Look at the three pillar foundation tiles available on the board. The value of the die you choose for the action determines which of the three you can take. However, the cost of the tile must be paid as well. Each foundation has its own cost displayed at the top of it. It's usually a combination of limestone and granite. Pay the required resources back to the supply and take the tile. Immediately gain the victory points as shown above the space the tile was. You may place the foundation tile on any empty space in the temple and gain the reward shown on the space you place it. For each building in the same row and column as the new pillar, gain one point. The tiles have colors around the outside edges. For every matching adjacent edge, gain another point. It could be from other foundation tiles or from the outer temple edge. The four corners are special and that they give you an extra point for each match when placed there. The pillar foundation tiles will have a background of either sunny, shaded, or dark. Should this color match the section of the obelisk wheel currently assigned to the raw action area, then you can immediately activate the ability shown on the foundation tile itself. Next, put one of your pillars on it to mark it as yours. Slide the remaining foundation tiles to the right to fill in the empty space and refill with the topmost tile of the stack. The next section is the Hathor God Action Area. This action lets you build buildings around the temple and increase your population marker on the track below. Buildings can be constructed and placed on the outer spaces with the building image and bread cost shown. However, not all of them are available in two or three player games. 
those will be noted on the spaces. After choosing a space to put the building, pay the bread cost shown and take the leftmost building from your player board to put it there. After placing the building, look for any of your pillars in its column or row. For each one, gain three victory points. Then for each empty space in the row or column, gain one of the shown icon. It could be a resource or faith. No matter how many are depicted, only get one per space. Lastly, advance your population marker on the track equal to the value of the die used for the action. Whenever anyone's population marker reaches a new colored area, you'll add cards to the next section of the card market. The green area corresponds to these four spots, and the blue area to the last four. Fill in the cards face up from the associated decks. The next god action is for the god Bastet, who lets you hold a festival to increase the happiness of your people. To take the action, pay two papyrus and advance your happiness marker a number of spaces to the right equal to the value of the die being used to take the action. Your happiness marker can never exceed your population marker. The first time your happiness marker meets the 16th space, gain one gold as a bonus. When reaching the 19th space, gain one scribe. And if you reach space 21 with the happiness marker, immediately gain an extra action to perform immediately without having to take a die. You can do any action as if you had any die value and color. Additionally, after moving your marker, if the die you used was a 1 or 2, gain 2 scribes. If it was a 3 or 4, gain 1 scribe. The Thoth God action is next going clockwise and lets you gain 1 or more cards from the card market. There's Blessings, which are usable one time, Technologies, which give you ongoing effects, and Decrees that provide more ways to score points at the end of the game. You can collect any number of cards. Blessings can sit face up in front of you and can be used when it says to. Discard it after using it. The technology cards also sit face up on the table in front of you, but are never discarded. Their effects apply situationally throughout the rest of the game. The decree cards should be kept secret from other players. Up to three of your decrees can score at the end of the game, but they must have different icons at the top. The number of cards you can gain is based on the value of the dice used for the action. For value 1 or 2, you get one card from the market for free. For a value 3 or 4, you must pay 2 Papyrus, then gain 2 cards. With a value 5 or 6, pay 3 Papyrus and take 3 cards. You can't pay less or take less than what's owed for the die value. All cards taken must come from the same colored section. The sections available to you is completely dependent on how far your happiness marker has advanced on the track. By default, you can always take from the first grouping. Before choosing cards to gain, you always have the option to pay a papyrus to discard all cards in a section and refill it. Each section can be refilled like this one time each per Thoth God action. At the end of your turn, refill empty spots in the card market from the appropriate decks. The discard piles can be shuffled if the decks ever run out. The last god action is for the Osiris god found in the bottom left corner of the board. With this action, you'll be able to construct a building on an empty space in one of the four columns. Each column is known as a district. The left two are called workshops and the right two are called quarries. No resources need to be spent. Instead, you must move your happiness marker backwards one space. The value of the die determines which row you can put the building in. If your happiness marker is at zero or there are no eligible empty spots, you can't complete this action. You'll see bread costs below your buildings on your player board. Ignore these when removing the buildings. Instead, these are paid during each scoring phase. In the spaces where you put your building, you'll see each one has one or two resources highlighted in the upper left corner. You'll gain those from the supply immediately. Also in the middle of the space are production increase icons. This is how you can increase your production capacity for all four resource types. The shown resource will improve by as many arrows are depicted above it. If you're the first player to build in row two, you gain the gold resource on the side that was set up at the beginning of the game. The lower spaces in the columns provide more benefits than the ones higher up. For example, this space in the sixth row gives you two limestone resources and increases your limestone production twice. This icon with an arrow means you can get an additional production bump on any one resource, your choice. It could be the same. There are two scoring phases during the game. The first happens after two MOT phases. The last one is the final scoring in the game after the fourth MOT phase. You'll know it's a scoring phase because the arrow on the obelisk wheel will be pointing at the scoring markers. The first one to score is the single silver hourglass. Do the MOT phase first, 
then resolve the scoring phase. To resolve the scoring phase each time, first check the four columns in the Osiris action area. These districts each score three points to the player with the most pieces in the column. If a tie, whoever has the topmost piece breaks the tie. If a player has a statue at the top, it counts as the topmost piece in both columns below it, in addition to being counted for majority control. Next, score the temple for each player. Each building and statue you have around the temple scores one point. Each pillar in the temple complex scores one point per building and statue belonging to you in the same row and column. Now each player scores points for having built statues. Check your player board. Score the rightmost points in the statue area above the rightmost empty space. Next, look at everyone's happiness markers on that track. You'll see small triangles above certain numbered spaces. You get three points per triangle your happiness marker has reached. It's not cumulative, so only score the rightmost group of triangles your happiness marker has reached. So if reaching at least space 13, you'll score six points. Now for each production marker on your board that has reached the topmost position on its track, score two points. Across the top of the player boards where buildings are, score the sum of any victory points shown below any empty spaces. Lastly, you must pay all bread costs shown below those same empty spaces in that row. For each bread you're unable or unwilling to pay for, lose three points. Remember, you can't go below zero points on the victory point track. Then remove the hourglass scoring marker from the game board. If the obelisk wheel's arrow is pointing to the final hourglass scoring token, make sure to resolve the final knot phase before doing the scoring phase again. After you've scored everything I just described, players now reveal all their decree cards collected during the game. Up to three can score for each player, but no more than one decree per type indicated by the printed symbol on the card. Score its provided points, as with all earned points, by moving your victory point marker on the VP track on the outer edge of the board. Each decree card, blessing card, and technology card has a full description of its effects and scoring method in the rulebook in the back. Then the player whose Mont marker is first on the turn order track gains three points. Whoever is second gains two points. However, in a two-player game, the second place points aren't scored. That concludes the game. Whoever has the most victory points wins. If there's a tie, whoever has the highest total number of scribes is the winner. If still tied, whoever is higher up on the turn order track wins. Tekenu Obelisk of the Sun can be played completely solo by using the solo mode rules included in the rulebook. You'll set up as if for a two-player game like normal, playing against an AI opponent named Botan Common. Set him up with his own pieces in a chosen color, but put his production markers back in the box. He does not use a player board. Don't deal him any starting decree cards. He begins with four happiness and seven population on the track. Botan Common starts the game as first in turn order. He'll randomly gain either the gold or scribe destiny card, but not take the reward. Shuffle the starting cards and take three randomly. Choose two to be your starting cards. Put out one of Botan Common's statues on the obelisk wheel area in honor of the god Horus. Collect all of the solo game pieces, including the ten action tiles, one progress marker, and one Debon token. Shuffle together the action tiles and place them face up in a pyramid pattern. Four along the bottom, then three, two, and one on top. Put the progress marker to the left of the base of the pyramid. Put the Debon token near the tiles for now. To resolve the AI's turn, first check if the progress marker is to the left of the base of the pyramid. If so, move it onto the bottom leftmost tile and resolve its effect. Otherwise, flip the Debon token like flipping a quarter. If it's this result with the head, move the progress marker to the top right adjacent tile and resolve that tile's effect. If it's the tails side of the token, move it to the right side adjacent tile in the same row and resolve its effect. The progress marker only resets to the bottom left again at the end of a mot phase. Anytime he resolves an action tile, he takes one die and performs a god action corresponding to the section the die was taken from. Just keep the dice he takes near his pyramid. He never pays costs associated with actions, and never performs the produce resources action. The only tokens he gains is scribes. If an action would let him gain one of the gold tokens set up at the beginning of the game on the board, just discard it. As I said, he always does the god action associated from where the die was taken. If he's resolving one of these four resource tiles in his pyramid, first take the highest valued pure or tainted die corresponding in color to the first resource shown on the tile. 
If tied for highest value, he takes a die from the section where he has a statue if possible. It prefers taking from the Horus bonus area if tied. Otherwise, if none of the matching colored dice are in sections with his statue, he takes a random one. Should no dice be in the color needed matching the first resource on the tile, move on to the second resource shown, and on until a possible choice can be made. In the very rare case, none of the four resource gathering dice colors are available, he'll take the highest valued gray dice. Then he does the god action associated with the section you took the die from. To resolve an action tile showing one of the gods printed on the tile, first take the highest valued pure or tainted die in that section. If the dice are tied between a pure and tainted one, he takes the pure one. Otherwise, pick randomly among them. Should no dice exist in that god section, or they are all forbidden, proceed to the next god section going counterclockwise until a die can be gained. Then he performs the god action from that section. During the mot phase of a solo game, Bowden Common's balance is fixed for each of the four mot phases. In the first one, it's positive three. In the second, it's positive two. In the final two, it's positive one. His Ankh value is always a 4. When he becomes first in turn order and must choose a destiny card, randomly give him either the gold or scribe card. Then shuffle all the action tiles and create a new pyramid. Reset the progress marker to the left of the base of the pyramid. To resolve the AI's Horus God action, he prefers to put a new statue out to honor gods around the obelisk. If the corresponding space for the die value is taken, he instead builds a statue for the people, starting with the workshops and quarries. Whichever of those two spots will have the biggest impact for control of the districts is which one he puts it on. If tied, pick randomly. If both are full or neither spot could affect control, he builds at the temple complex. He picks the one that lines up with more of his pillars. If tied, pick randomly. He then gets three points per pillar like normal. If those spaces are occupied, he simply scores three points. The Horus bonuses are adjusted for him when either of you take a god action with one of his statues. You gain the normal Horus bonus, but his is based on the position of the god's bonus. For the top two gods, he gains a scribe. For the third and fourth, he gains one victory point. For the last two positions, he gains both. When resolving the Ra god action, Boten Common puts a pillar out in the complex, taking the tile corresponding to the die value. Don't change the tile's orientation. Place it on an empty space where it scores the most points. He scores one point per building in the same row or column, regardless of whose it is. He gets one point per matching adjacent edge. He gains the one, two, or three points from the space the tile was taken from. He'll never get the reward covered by the tile, nor any ability printed on the tile. If there's a tie for which space would earn him the most points, break ties for the space in a row or column with one of its own houses. If still tied, it breaks ties in favor of a space not adjacent to the temple complex's edge. Otherwise, pick randomly. When resolving his Hathor God action, he constructs one of his buildings around the temple and scores points like normal and advances his population marker like normal. Don't give him any resources or faith tokens. The space he chooses will be where he scores the most points from his pillars. If tied, pick randomly. To do the Bastet God action, advance his happiness marker like normal and receive scribes as normal. If at any point he would advance his happiness marker further than his population marker, move the population marker instead. Do each move point one at a time. He doesn't gain any rewards from the track. The Thoth God action lets him game one, two, or three cards based on the die value taken like normal. He takes them in this priority order, decrees, technologies, then blessings. He takes from the highest segment possible. If there's multiple of the same kind to take, he prefers to take the leftmost one in the segment. Just keep his cards in a pile near him. The last possible god action is the Osiris action, where he can build a building in the row matching the die taken. He doesn't lose happiness when doing this. The color of the die determines the role of the building, the district it goes in. A yellow die means it goes in the papyrus workshop column. A brown die means it goes in the bread workshop. White is the limestone quarry, and black is the granite quarry. Taking the gray die means he chooses the district that has the fewest buildings. If tied, the building goes in the leftmost district. If occupied, put the building in the next space to the right and looping around back if necessary. Should the row be full, put it in the row above it and looping down to six from one. During each scoring phase, score your own points like normal. 
For Potent Common, score his points like a normal player with the four Osiris districts, buildings, statues, and pillars in the temple complex, number of statues built, and his position of the happiness marker. Each of his collected blessing cards gives him two points and then discarded. Each technology card gives him two points, but then kept so it can be scored again for him in the second scoring phase. He never scores points for production tracks, since he doesn't have them, nor buildings points or bread costs. For the final scoring phase, also score is three points if he's first in turn order. Each of his decrees scores him four points. Every two scribes he has are worth one point. There's plenty of ways to increase the difficulty of the solo game. For a medium difficulty, let Boat and Common start with a few extra pieces on the board. He can start with a building on the fifth row bread workshop space and the granite quarry space. Also put one of his pillars in the temple by drawing a random tile from the draw stack for its foundation. For the hard difficulty, in addition to these starting benefits, also add one of his statues to the Horus God Action section. Additionally, you can increase the points earned from his collected decrees. Each one can score 8 points instead of 4. Plus, for your starting cards, try starting with 2 random cards instead of picking 2 out of 3. Keep the rulebook handy and check BoardGameGeek.com for FAQs and extra content. Thank you for watching this tutorial. Like and subscribe if you found this teaching helpful. Stick around to watch another Learn to Play video. And remember, teach when you can, but always be learning. See you next time.